Good morning. Uh, our Sunday school lesson today is, is probably a, a very familiar one to you. Uh, you hear it quite often, and especially as, as we are, are uh, ex experiencing the, the days just before Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, as we're looking at, at that chapter uh, in Matthew, where again he's attempting to prepare his disciples for, for what's forthcoming. Uh, chapter 26 of the book of Matthew reveals Jesus for a fourth time announcing to his disciples that he would soon be going to his death at the hands of the chief priests and elders of the Jewish people. In verses 3 through 5, Matthew abruptly switches to those who are preparing to remove this troublemaker from Galilee out of their way. Caiaphas, the high priest, presided over the Sanhedrin, the supreme Jewish council. And under the auspices of the Roman government, they could enact or carry out legislative, executive, or judicial functions as long as those functions were of no consequence to Rome. Now, this group of conspirators declared it was the appropriate time to confront Jesus because they were afraid that he would inspire a Jewish uprising among the Jewish pilgrims who would be coming from outlying areas to support him and diminish the power of the Sanhedrin. Well, verses 6 through 13 of this 26th chapter of Matthew reveal that, that uh, Jesus was dining in Bethany with a man named Simon, when an unidentified woman entered the room and anointed Jesus, pouring a bottle of expensive perfume on his head. Matthew's purpose for sharing this event seems to reinforce the idea that the woman's devoted awareness of Jesus as royalty was to be honored, and it contrasted with the disciples and their insensitivity. They thought the woman's actions were wasteful and the expense of the perfume could have been better applied to give alms to the poor. But Jesus recognized the symbolism of her action and told his listeners that she had prepared him to be buried. In verses 14 through 16, we shift then to, to Judas as he went to the chief priest to negotiate a deal to betray Jesus to them. This action concluded the events on that Wednesday, and the rest of the chapter occurs on Thursday. In verses 17 through 19, the Passover meal is prepared. According to Jewish tradition, the meal would have included lamb and herbs, which are not mentioned in this account. Some scholars believe that this meal that is referenced may have occurred a day or so before Passover, but it may also be that the emphasis on the bread and the wine come as the meal was being concluded and Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for what was about to occur. Well, anyway, as the meal is underway, in verses 20 through 25, Jesus says that one of the disciples will betray him. And when Judas asks if it is him, Jesus confirms to him that it is. Perhaps the other disciples were talking among themselves or were so upset over what Jesus had said that they didn't hear this exchange. Judas was seated next to Jesus, which would have been a position of honor, possibly because as the group's treasurer, he would be discussing expenses and arranging to accommodate financial needs for the days ahead. But now, let us look at our focal passage for today's lesson. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 30. <clears throat> While they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. He took a cup 
gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, so that their sins may be forgiven. I tell you, I won't drink wine again until that day when I drink it in a new way with you in my Father's kingdom. Then, after singing songs of praise, they went to the Mount of Olives. You know, I heard a story about a young boy and his mother who had been spending the day with the boy's aunt. They were awaiting the arrival of the boy's dad before they served lunch. And the mother explained that her husband, who was a minister, would be delayed for a while because he was giving blood to a member of the church because the man had been involved in an accident and was in the hospital. The young boy wasn't too upset by the news as he explained to his aunt, well, we know it's just grape juice that he's giving out, don't we? You know, perhaps the explanation of communion may need to be clarified a bit. Children shouldn't get the idea that on special occasions, snacks are offered during the church service. I've recently been pleased to see children actually serving as acolytes and participating as servers during communion, holding the wine cups and proclaiming to each participant, this is Jesus' blood shed for you. It remains up to each participant to respect the observance of the Lord's Supper is part of our witness and a reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made for all of us. When Jesus took the bread and blessed it, he was probably using the words of the traditional Jewish meal prayer, which included the lines, Blessed art thou, O Lord, King of the universe, who dost bring forth bread from the earth. Then when he took the cup of wine, the prescribed prayer would have been, Praised be thou, O Lord, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. But what was different at this meal was his instruction to his disciples at the table. Take and eat. This is my body. And then with the cup, he added, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many so that their sins may be forgiven. At that time, there was no Aramaic word for body, so probably he used the word that could be translated as self. This is myself, he would have said in referring to the bread. This is myself, inferring his ongoing presence in future observances. The blood of the covenant phrase in verse 28 is associated with the forgiveness of sins. Recall the angel who visited Joseph emphasized that this forgiveness of sins was Jesus', was Jesus primary mission and the sacrifice imagery of the blood would have originated with the blood of the covenant phrase in Exodus 24, 8 where Moses splashed blood from a sacrificed animal to ratify the covenant that God had made with his chosen people. Jesus' use of these same words suggests that he had now assumed the sacrificial role for himself. Verse 29 then reinforces the emphasis on Jesus' forthcoming death as he tells those gathered at the table that he won't drink wine again until the day when he drinks it in a new way in his Father's kingdom. In verse 30, we read that their Passover observance ended with their singing songs of praise. This would not have been just a, a fellowship of friends singing popular songs of the day to uplift their spirits. <laughs> Some of you may remember the early days of television when Roy Rogers would have been crooning away, happy trails to you until we meet again. But no, this would have been far more structured for the Passover feast 
as the Hallel praise series of hymns and psalms that would be offered as a concluding praise of God for his sparing Israel from a life of bondage and servitude. Then after the music of these psalms had faded, Jesus and his disciples left from their meal and made their way to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus would pray while his most trusted disciples slept and his betrayer was meeting with the officials who would come to make their arrest. As we observe communion, do we come to the table with the reverence that we should? A few years ago, I was visiting a lady who lived nearby. She had once been a very faithful member of the church, but her health prevented her attendance and a full-time caregiver was there to help her each day. She was thankful that she could still watch the Sunday sermons online, but she said that what she missed most was the sharing of communion. I spoke to the minister about her situation, and he immediately agreed to take communion to her after her next observance in church. For the next few years, she was able to participate in communion. When the minister had other obligations, I would fill in for him, usually seeing in her eyes tears of joy and thanksgiving as she again felt the companionship and love that she would have experienced in the sanctuary with her fellow Christian friends. The way we observe communion, we should observe it because we follow a risen Savior. And he was sharing this meal with those who believed in him, but would eventually believe even more in an everlasting life because he had sacrificed himself for each of them and for each of us. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for preparing for us a place at your table. Help us to represent you and to attempt to show our love and our appreciation of the sacrifice that Jesus was willing to make for us. Amen.